Welcome, and thank you for joining us for another edition of the Darien Library Meet the Author series. For more information about this and other upcoming library events, please visit us at darienlibrary.org. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'd like to welcome you to Darien Library. My name is Erin Shea, and I'm the head of adult programming here. I'd like to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make programs and our collections available to the community. Tonight's guest is the President and CEO of Weight Watchers International Incorporated. In this capacity, he oversees a network of service providers around the world who help 1.3 million people in its meetings each week. His business and personal philosophies are grounded in the belief that obesity prevention is achievable and can be realized through a combination of smart governance, industry support, and community empowerment. Prior to his current position, he held several positions within the company, including Chief Operating Officer for Europe and Asia and President of WeightWatchers.com. He's the author of the popular weight loss blog, Man Meets Scale, which you can find at manmeetscale.blogspot.com. Tonight, he is here to discuss his book, Weight Loss Boss, in which he gives tips to avoid late-night treat sneaking, shares his own secrets for changing eating habits, and discusses the merits of beef jerky, which you will know is low in points but high in protein. I'd also just like to mention that all royalties from this book will be donated to Share Our Strengths No Kid Hungry campaign. Now, please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Mr. Dave Kirkland. I've given a lot of talks in my life and over the past few years, but this is definitely the most bizarre. <laughs> um, too many, too many different worlds colliding all at once. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, so I don't have to be pinned down to the microphone. That's great. Um, so you know, this this book was kind of nothing I ever really expected to do. Uh, I couldn't really imagine writing a book that was a, a thousand miles away from anything I ever sort of saw in my future. But uh, something happened uh, almost four years ago. I was encouraged by a friend of mine who is, you know, very active in kind of media and PR circles. Uh, he started telling me that it was important for me to uh, build my brand. Uh, I still don't know what that means. Uh, but what he suggested was, he said, well, why don't you start writing? Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting because I felt like at that point I had a lot to say. I've been with Weight Watchers for about seven years at that point, or was it more like nine? Uh, but I started writing a blog called Man Meets Scale, and I, I made a decision when I started writing the blog uh, that I wasn't going to spend a lot of time sort of writing it from the perspective of, being, of having the job that I had, which was uh, CEO of the company. Or rather, I was going to write it from my experience as a Weight Watchers member. Uh, and in, in doing so, my idea was that I would just sort of like bear my soul uh, and write about different stuff each week and just sort of see how it went. Uh, didn't really promote it much. It kind of grew sort of at its own pace for a long time. Uh, and I found something interesting, which is that the more that I wrote, uh, and the more that I kind of like revealed way, way too much about myself, uh, the more that people seemed to respond to that. Um, when I would write about like something awesome I did, uh, I didn't get that many comments, but when I wrote about when I screwed up royally, uh, people were really into that. Uh, and it's actually, it's a kind of a, a truism of, of the, the issue of weight, which is I think all of us are sort of wired with the belief that we're the only ones that really struggle with the issue. And that the, the failings that we have and the challenges and all the problems we have are somehow unique to us as individuals. Yet, when we spend time with each other and we actually talk about this stuff in what we would call a safe environment, in other words, around people that are going through the same thing, uh, that people realize that all the crazy stuff that they're dealing with, everybody else is dealing with. Uh, and that's really been the foundation of Weight Watchers from the very first days is based on that very simple principle uh, that people would have much more success uh, in, in a weight loss effort if they're around other people that are going through the same experience. Um, 
so I kept writing the blog, and what was what was also fun for me is that uh, you know the the perk of the job is I get exposed to a lot of interesting stuff uh, and a lot of interesting research. Uh, all the way from where did the obesity epidemic come from? What are the really, what are the true causes behind it? Uh, but also, you know, what are the reasons why we overeat? Uh, why is it that we're so out of control? Why is it that you know we can't seem to make our brains function the way we want to, and we do dumb stuff? Uh, and there's just so much great, great, great research coming out. And so I started doing this thing where I would try to then interpret the research to kind of my own Michigas. Uh, and so what was, it, it almost ended up being this kind of self-experimentation thing where I would actually try to take each concept and just sort of see to what extent it was reflected in the things that I did. So that ended up becoming something that I was writing pretty much once a week, uh, call it a column if you will, uh, on a blog. And from that I was approached by a publisher and trying to see if I could assemble all of it and, and add some new stuff and come up with a book and that's what I did. Now, what was interesting about the book for me was that I started writing the blog uh, when I became what's called in Weight Watchers parlance a, um, a lifetime member. So I got gotten my goal weight, uh, and uh, I've been keeping the weight off. And, and actually, that's kind of an important part of, of what's in the book, is that it's really written from the perspective of someone not losing weight, but rather someone who has been working really hard to keep the weight off uh, over the past close to four years. Uh, the significance of that is that what I, would, what I tell people all the time is that I wish I knew when I was trying to lose my weight what I now know having the, the things I've learned keeping the weight off. Um, the, uh, but in, in, because the blog was written when I was already in maintenance, I actually had to go back and think about what was the experience of first gaining my weight uh, and then what was the experience of losing it and then applying uh, a lot of the other concepts that I kind of wanted to get into. Uh, so I'll share with you a brief story uh, of my life, and my parents were always really excited that I do this because I kind of hang them out to dry a little bit. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, the reason I tell the story uh, will, will make sense in a little bit, but basically growing up as a kid, uh, all the way through high school, I was ridiculously skinny. Uh, and I attribute a lot of it to the fact that, you know, so this was the late 60s, early 70s, uh, our food was served up on nine-inch plates. Uh, and that was funny, right? <laughs> I think a nine-inch plate you'd look at and say, well, it's about the right size for my donut. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, food was served on nine-inch plates, and, you know, you got a meal when you got a meal. Uh, so it was like breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, and I had the, the added twist of my mother, awesome person, great mother, so unbelievably frugal, it's terrifying. Um, <laughs> You know, she was an early adopter on the whole trend of private label. Uh, so this is going back when private label used to come in like the white box with black letters. <laughs> it wasn't Cheerios, it was oats and cherry, you know, powdered milk. That was our house. Uh, and we did not have the drawer full of like good stuff. Yeah. Uh, my, my friends did, but I didn't have the drawer full of good stuff. In fact, uh, my mother was, was, she was so frugal uh, that uh, she used to send me to school with like not one of those pre-cut lunch bags but like kind of the big sort of used grocery bag uh, and you know the interesting thing about that was that you know I literally lived in a non-obesogenic environment uh, what I mean by obesogenic environment is an environment where we're surrounded with junk food and I'll talk about that in a second uh, but there was nothing to eat there was nothing to sneak in my house I got dessert once a week uh, it was called Treat of the Week. Uh, I went to McDonald's four to five times a year, and every single time was a glorious occasion. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I got like one birthday dinner for like a Chinese or Indian restaurant or, or something like that, but that was kind of the way I lived. Uh, and I was crazy skinny. Uh, something interesting happened. I went to college, uh, and sort of every bad decision you can make in college, I, I did some of. Uh, and not the least of which was sort of, you know, it's like the, the, the cliche of, you know, beer and beer's friend for later pizza and kind of the whole thing and started gaining a lot of weight in college. Uh, but actually, from my point of view, it kind of got me to sort of a normal weight. Uh, I, in other words, I, I felt like when I was in high school, I was sort of too skinny, emaciated 
guy, then I got to college, I was sort of normal guy, then I got a job with a credit card, and I became eat everything in sight guy. Uh, and I kept gaining weight. Uh, and I was also living on the road, a lot of time in, in you know, hotels and room service and airplane food and everything else. Uh, and lo and behold, you know, from my senior year in high school to when I was about 32, I was, that was a swing of close to 70 some odd pounds. Uh, and so uh, at this time I had been studiously avoiding uh, getting a physical for years. Uh, finally, someone in my house browbeat me into actually getting physical. Uh, and I did, uh, with a doctor, she's still practicing, uh, out of Costco. Uh, but I stepped on that scale uh, and tipped it at about 245 pounds. And I had a, what's called a body mass index uh, of a little bit north of 30, uh, which meant I was clinically obese. Uh, and I had a cholesterol of about 270. Uh, which uh, then I was having a conversation with my doctor about going on statins. And for a guy in his mid-30s to hear about statins was, was pretty scary stuff. Uh, you know, my dad was on statins. It's like, it's, it's sort of old man medicine. Uh, but nonetheless, this was kind of where I was. So it was, geez, that's not good. I tried to count calories for a little bit. Uh, fits and starts. Uh, but then, uh, just through serendipity, I happened to get an opportunity to uh, leave Pepsi, ironic, I realize, uh, and take a job at Weight Watchers, helping them start up an internet business. Uh, and so that's kind of how I got into the Weight Watchers business. Uh, and I figured I should actually learn something about this whole Weight Watchers thing, so I became one of these guys that was showing up at Weight Watchers meetings. There weren't many of us back then. Uh, we were brave and comfortable with our masculinity. <laughs> um, and so uh, you, you'll find more guys now at Weight Watchers meetings, and you'll find even more online. It's sort of the brand is becoming much more gender neutral these days, but nonetheless, it was, I was kind of a pioneer back then. Uh, but I started losing weight. Now, what I, would tell, what I tell people, and I was kind of embarrassed to write about this when I wrote the book, that it took me nine years from when I started at Weight Watchers to actually get to my goal weight. Uh, so I'm a pretty slow learner. Um, it took me a long time to get to my goal weight, and, and I think the reason for that is is because I was kind of doing it the wrong way. Uh, I was using Weight Watchers like a diet, uh, and when I say diet, what I mean is is basically doing something abnormal for you know, a period of time, so that you lose a bunch of weight, and then you go back to whatever you're doing before, and you're shocked to see that the weight comes back. Uh, and I really wasn't addressing kind of the way that I lived. Uh, I really wasn't doing all the things that are associated with actually living a different way and actually having a healthy lifestyle. Uh, when I did finally get to my goal weight, uh, I was, uh, it was, the thing I am proud of is the fact that I've actually kept the weight off for the past three to four years. Uh, what I would tell you is that if you've ever had a weight issue, uh, you know, you and, and if you either you still want to lose weight or you 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 know you've lost the weight, if you've lost the weight, you live in terror that the weight's going to come back because you're absolutely convinced that you know you're somehow like we're, you're living on borrowed time, uh, that that something bad is going to happen, the weight's going to come back, and and you worry about that. Um, on some level, that's true. Uh, what I tell people all the time is that if you have a weight issue, you will always have a weight issue. Uh, and that's not easy stuff to hear, but I'm just being honest. Uh, if you struggle with weight, you always struggle with weight, you always have to be careful. Uh, the good news is, is that there is a way to be careful and there is a way to do this systematically. Uh, the point that I would make, kind of going back to like why tell the whole story of my childhood, is that that's kind of a reflection of what's happened in this country over the past 30 years. And I'm going to say this, I'm keenly aware of the fact that we have an election coming up, and God help me, I don't want to get into a discussion about politics, <laughs> particularly if you were to know that I was like one of the 12 Democrats that lives in the town of Darien. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> hanging on by my fingernails. <laughs> um, what I would, but you know, the thing I would say is that you know, if you if you kind of imagine the human body, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing, and that it has all these amazing mechanisms that were designed to keep us alive. Uh, we have these things called fat stores. 
that allow us to basically accumulate energy, store it, and then release it back into our blood when we need it because we may go for a period of time without a meal. Uh, it's an amazing invention of biology uh, that we can do that because 10,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, frankly 150 years ago, it wasn't always that clear when the next meal was going to come. Uh, we also have brains that have been conditioned to push us to go get the food when the food can be gotten. Uh, same set of instincts that have led to that development. Uh, because again, the idea is, is that if all of a sudden you, know, you have to stockpile, you should stockpile because it may be at least a day before you get another decent meal. And this is just thousands of years of evolution in the making. But if you look at what's happened in our food environment, literally almost overnight, everything changed. So if you look at the amount of calories that are available in the food system today uh, per person versus what was available in the food system, say, uh, in 1970, it's an increase of about 30 to 40 percent uh, that works out to six to 800 calories per person, more food available. It doesn't all get consumed because we have a lot of food waste in our system, but we are eating, on average, versus 1970, say about an extra two to 300 calories per day. That may not sound like much, but that literally that difference is all that is necessary to create an obesity epidemic. Uh, what's also troubling about that increase of food in the food supply is that most of it is foods that are with foods with added sugars and fats, otherwise known as processed food, and in many cases known as junk food, and on top of that, the fact that you know consumers and people that were in restaurants have been having an arms race to basically jack up the size of, uh, of the foods that you can get. I saw the guy from the editor from Men's Health, who was actually the, the publisher of this book, just uh, put out a tweet that the Cheesecake Factory now has a breakfast that clocks in at 2,900 calories. <laughs> Um, and, and by the way, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it looked damn good. Um, but this is kind of the this is this is so this is the environment we're in. And I think the thing that we're the thing we're realizing from research is that on, in a bunch of different mechanisms baked into our brain, we're wired to overeat. We are. Uh, and, you know, the, the traditional way people have thought about eating is there's a mechanism in your body, think of it as your body's thermostat, uh, in that when you start running out of energy, uh, you have hormones going back and forth from your stomach to your brain, your hypothalamus, that is telling you that you're hungry or you're full. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of discussions, if any of you follow nutrition, you'll hear these endless discussions, is it low fat, is it low carbs, is sugar the enemy, all these types of things. Uh, and this gets into you know blood glucose levels and sort of how insulin responds to different chemicals and, and, and lots of interesting stuff. What I would tell you, and I've got a pretty good view into sort of the research that goes on in this area, is that literally thousands of people and thousands of studies are done in this area. Uh, there's, there's truth in a lot of the things that you hear, but if you actually look at the synthesis of all of that <coughs> research, what you're led to the conclusion is that, by and large, what to eat is the least complicated part of this whole discussion, uh, which is eat vegetables, fruits, lean proteins, whole grains, watch your portion size, cut out junk food, exercise daily, repeat. That's it. The book is only one page long. <laughs> it, uh, it, it's, but that's the easy part. And, and the advice I give to people is don't overthink the food stuff. It's not complicated. Mostly eat non-processed food. Uh, mostly eat fruits and vegetables. You know, the, the dietary guidelines, I think they finally, after decades, got it right. You know, they're no longer doing the five-dimensional space pyramid that nobody could quite figure out what it was. And instead, it's just a plate. And the, and the big guideline is fill half your plate with fruits and vegetables. It's not complicated. The hard part is making it happen in life. Uh, and that's really where we see people struggling. There's been research more recently, uh, so the, the system I just described is called the, uh, for the nerds in the room, uh, the homeostatic eating system, uh, which is more about kind of energy processing. Uh, there's a second system that is now getting recognition that is called the hedonic eating system. You might note that that sounds a lot like hedonism, uh, and there's a reason for that. 
Uh, so what they've done is they've actually taken people and they've given them functional MRIs, so they slide them into this scary chamber of isolation. Uh, and while they're there, they flash pictures of bowls of ice cream. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, people who struggle with weight, when they start seeing, like, you know, tasty food, uh, they, they have these images of their brain and it's lighting up like a Christmas tree. Uh, people who are naturally thin, there's nothing going on. And, and honest to God, like people who are naturally thin, I have to say, when it comes to like food, they're a little dim with it. <laughs> um, it's just, it's like literally it has no impact. But for, for most of us, we see it and, and literally our brain starts lighting up and actually something's happening chemically, which is your brain is conditioned to say, this looks awesome, it's going to be so awesome to eat, and you get a dopamine release. Uh, so you're actually getting a secretion in your brain that is pleasure. Uh, and it is exactly the same mechanism, by the way, that works with uh, alcohol, cigarettes, you name it. It's effectively kind of a form of addiction in its own way. Uh, there's been a lot of really interesting research by people that have studied, uh, they call them hot states and cold states. Uh, and this was a it's, a, it's a principle around psychology that was really used originally to explain risky sexual behavior. Uh, which is very simply stated, people do dumb things in the heat of the moment. Uh, but lo and behold, what they found is that it also, so your Anthony Weiner Twitter, like that's a hot state. Uh, whereas a cold state would be making a plan uh, ahead of time to say not be on Twitter with a girl from Las Vegas. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it applies to food too. And what the research has shown is that when people are right in front of food, uh, they have a hard time controlling themselves if they don't have a plan. Uh, what, what they've also shown is that people also have an issue with uh, visual distortion, uh, which is another way of saying stuff that comes in large containers, we tend to eat more of it. Uh, and they've studied this over and over again. Like They've done very humorous experiments with like uh, self-refilling uh, bowls of soup. Uh, and so they'll have like one long table and they'll have a bunch of people on one side of the table eating automatic re refilling bowls of soup. They don't know that. Uh, and the other table, their soup bowls, like it goes down as they eat. And at the end, they ask people to estimate how much soup they've had. They're supposed to eat until they feel, you know, reasonably satisfied. The people with the bottomless bowls of soup uh, tend to under-report how much they eat by about 70%. Uh, the people without the endless bowls of soup under-report how much they eat by about 30%. Now, this is one of the hard parts of uh, the issue of, of obesity is that, you know, consistent research over the years has shown that people tend to underestimate how much they eat by 30%. Uh, curiously enough, they tend to overestimate how much they exercise by 30%. Uh, those two things don't really work that well together. Uh, and, and the point is, and what's interesting is, so, you know, everybody knows about the mayor and the whole big gulp thing uh, in New York City. Uh, and I kept getting browbeaten of one way or another, do I have an opinion about it? Uh, and we finally came out in support uh, of Bloomberg. I mean, we, we really do try to avoid a lot of this political stuff. But the point that I made was the reason he did what he did was based on really solid research which is that if you give people a Coke in a 64-ounce cup, they will surely drink more of it because people have a hard time stopping. That's not human frailty. It's human nature. Uh, and you have this weird thing where restaurants, consumers say, I want more value. The restaurant tries to be responsive to giving you more value, and they literally keep jacking up portion sizes in a way that's really becoming kind of destructive. So the mayor's idea was to simply tell the, in this case, restaurants and movie theater chains, like why the stuff is sold in movie theaters and the size that it is is a mystery to me. <laughs> Nobody needs to eat a candy bar that's that big. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it was less about restricting consumers from doing anything, because you can buy two Cokes, and it was more to try to get the people that were selling it to sort of do things differently. So now there's a whole discussion on personal liberty and freedom and all this kind of stuff. So. It's, my point is, I don't care. Uh, I, I think the biggest reason why I came out in support of him is that everybody else is flapping their gums about this, and he actually did something. Uh, and he did something that he knew was going to be unpopular. Uh, and he did it anyway. And in this day and age, whatever your political beliefs are, if you're willing to do something, that should be worth something. Uh, and in this case, he did. 
But I, I think that the point is, is that behind it is this whole notion of, for example, plate size. Uh, so why do we serve food on 12-inch plates? Uh, we will eat more of it. We're conditioned to. We use, the, we use the nothing left on plate as a cue to tell us that we're done eating. That's kind of the way our brains work. Uh, so a lot of what this book ends up getting into is really kind of exploring that and then trying to understand what do you do about it. Uh, and the answer is there's a lot you can do about it, but the absolute worst thing you can do about it is try to exert willpower. Uh, so if, if you look at kind of all the reasons why we overeat, there's this thing going on with the hypothalamus I was just talking about with, with ghrelins and leptins, which are these hormones that have to do with do I have enough energy or not. There's this thing with you know, the top of our brain, which is where the kind of reward stimulation, uh, I really want a piece of cake so I can get off on it kind of thing. Uh, you know, we have these habits that live in the basal ganglia at the base of our brain, which causes us to eat for no apparent reason while we're watching TV. Uh, and then the only thing that's holding back all of these forces is our prefrontal lobe, uh, which is the part of our brain that governs impulsive behavior. Uh, and the prefrontal lobe, over time, gets depleted. Actually, there was some interesting research around this called willpower depletion otherwise known as uh, decision fatigue, which is that if you force people to make a decision over and over again, eventually they break. Uh, it is a principle used, for example, in, say, waterboarding. Uh, apparently it also applies to food, uh, because lo and behold, we make about 200 food decisions every day, but we can only recall about 10 to 15 of them. And you might say, well, how is that possible? And I would say very easily possible, as I walk over here, and you're probably not looking at me anymore because you're looking at that. And you're, you may almost be wondering, like, could I actually get up and take a brownie and walk back to my seat, or would that be great? Uh, and every time you're going through that mental math, you're effectively making a decision, and over time, you will break. Everybody breaks. Uh, and the point is, is that if there were no brownies there, you wouldn't be inclined to eat a brownie. So rather than use willpower, what we're trying to do is get people to, you know, let's not worry about, you know, Mike Bloomberg trying to regulate the way all of our stores work. It's not going to happen anyway, in truth, because I don't think there's a political will to regulate the food system back to the way it looked in the 1970s. So that's not really going to help us. On the other hand, we can all be the Mike Bloomberg of our homes. So this is a big point, which is that if you have a crazy food environment in your kitchen and it's all on display, you will overconsume. You can't help it uh, because eventually you will break. If you have junk food, you keep it out of sight. Hopefully, you don't have junk food. Uh, these, it's you. What you want is an environment where a healthy decision is a very easy decision to make, where a bad decision is inconvenient. It's a very simple principle, but honestly, it works. The other thing I would say is that the, you know, the biggest thing that has helped me uh, in, in dealing with my own weight issue is, is a simple recognition that what if you didn't have to make decisions, but the healthy thing was happening on autopilot? Wouldn't that be easier? Uh, and the, the, the truth is that's actually possible. Uh, because habits aren't necessarily bad. A lot of habits are really good. Uh, the habit is a very convenient way for the brain to keep you from going insane. What I mean by that is a very simple example to express what a habit is is brushing your teeth at night. So, if you think through every little thing you do when you brush your teeth, you might start with, it is bedtime, right, I need to brush my teeth, okay, it's time for me to stand up, I'm walking into the bathroom, I'm turning on the light, I'm walking to the sink, I'm now turning on the cold water, I'm grabbing a toothbrush, I'm lifting it out, I'm now wetting the bristles, I'm taking them back, I'm taking the tube of toothpaste, you get the idea. Like, you don't do this when you're brushing your teeth, you're kind of brush your teeth. Uh, it is your brain's way of taking a whole bunch of, you know, either relatively complicated instructions and chunking them down into one single act that happens very quickly. Uh, and there's a whole process of just basically repeating something enough times with enough of a reward to make it worth your brain's while to bake it into the system. Uh, and so the example I give is that when I first started 
with Weight Watchers, uh, I was what would be described as uh, a sporadic exerciser, and I don't think that's really doing justice to the word sporadic. <laughs> um, like a lot of guys, I mean, this, this stuff kind of snuck up on me, and I was not a regular exercise person other than kind of the, the typical fits and starts. Uh, but we had just had our second child, Lila, uh, for those of you who might know her. Uh, and the house was a bit of a mess and not a lot of me time. And so I started wandering down to the basement uh, so I could listen to my music for an hour by myself with the otherwise unused weights uh, in the basement. And I started then kind of building in this whole sort of routine where I would put up my gym clothes the night before, uh, I put an energy drink next to the mouse pad, and I would have everything set up the night before so that when the alarm clock went off at 5 a.m., the only thing I had to do was stand up. Uh, because at that point I was on autopilot. The workout would just kind of happen, and, and I wasn't really making a decision anymore. And over time, that ended up becoming like six to seven days a week uh, of going to the gym. Uh, and people, you know, who, who I know or who know about my routine, because I talk about myself incessantly, um, <laughs> would, would say like, oh, wow, that's really disciplined. And what I would say, it's not. I mean, it's literally, it happens, it's habit. And that kind of, it's, it's real stuff and it's real science. And so a lot of what we find is if you're going to have a long-term successful behavior change, what you have to do is start doing little routines like that that then kind of grow on their own and become bigger routines. If you try to do it all at once, it's really hard to do. But if you, if you pick a couple things, so I'll give you a recent example. Now, one of the big challenges for me uh, is travel. I mean, I travel nonstop. Uh, and it's a problem for me because I travel so much that people try to be nice to me. Uh, so uh, the other week I was down in DC uh, and I uh, checked into my hotel on Sunday night and I walked into the room and there was, uh, the first thing I saw was, was a huge plate of cookies. <laughs> a big letter saying, Welcome Dave. At least I didn't say Welcome Dave from Weight Watchers. <laughs> um, I freaked out. Uh, I, I did everything short of like jumping on my chair and screaming like I saw a mouse. Uh, and in just a moment of clarity, I took the cookies and I put them outside my door and shut the door. Uh, and lo and behold, I, I didn't eat the cookies. Uh, Thursday night I was up in Boston, I went to one of these rubber chicken dinners and they have a bottle of wine going around and I then checked into my hotel room later, again, a plate of cookies. Uh, this one didn't go so well. Uh, the cookies never made it outside. Uh, and, and my point is, is that when I, when I look at situations like that, I work really hard to try to wire my life when I travel to look like my life at home. I make a routine out of it. Uh, and to me, this is really important because I don't want to make decisions. Uh, I have the same breakfast every day. Uh, I have a limited selection of lunches, and I'm good with that because I don't want to have to make decisions because if I'm on autopilot, these healthy things just sort of happen naturally. And it's been a big part of what has allowed me to help me keep the weight off. And the point I would make is that for anyone struggling with a weight issue, this is kind of stuff you have to do. There's no other easy way around it. Um, I would also, the, the advice I give people all the time as well is that you can't do it in deprivation. And this is kind of a big deal, uh, which is that if you're miserable all the time, you will quit. There's absolutely no way you're going to stick with it. If you're hungry, if you're miserable, if you're climbing the walls, if you never have a, another piece of dessert again in your life, you will lose your mind and you'll quit. Uh, there is a way to eat food that you love, but the trick is to find foods that you love that love you back. Uh, so for example, I like to eat a lot of food. Uh, if any of you saw my breakfast, it is disturbingly large. <laughs> but it doesn't have very many calories. Uh, so I can't do this like little plates of food thing. Uh, but rather what I do is I'll take like plain oatmeal and I will bulk it up with like just a buttload of fruit. And I'll get non-fat Greek yogurt, which has a ton of protein. I have convinced myself over time that it really does taste good. <laughs> then mix it, I'll, I'll mix in grapes with that as well. And so to me, it's like it's stuff I like to eat. And it's a lot of it. Uh, so I'm not starving to death all the time. Jumped on board with the iPhone. We've now had close to 10 million iPhone downloads of our app. Wow. 
Uh, so now we're also on iPad, Android. We have a barcode scanner, you know, recipe databases. Uh, and so we have, so technology has, for a lot of people, it's sort of, it kind of creates a new dimension of the experience. It makes it more fun, makes it easier to do. And what's really amazing is that if you then combine that with this now turning 50-year-old program around group support, the combination of those two is amazingly potent uh, in helping people soldier through what can be a difficult process. Yes. Um, what percentage of people who join Weight Watcher actually get to their goal weight? And what percent stay at their goal weight for you know, five years or well, so let me answer that question two ways. Uh, because if you look at what percent get to their goal weight, the first thing I would say about that is that I don't know that it's the right question for the following reason. Uh, because what I would tell you is that, like, it's, it's kind of what I was saying before, there's no cure for this. There's just not. Uh, because you're always eating, uh, you're always going to be dealing with this issue. And what this means is that what we find is a lot of people will periodically come back to us and say, yeah, I mean, I kind of follow up my lifestyle and I need to get back on board. Uh, so we, there's, it's not easy to measure in the way you're describing it. What I would tell you is that in general, uh, and so, for example, does anybody know how many quit attempts it takes to kick smoking for the average person? Eight to ten. Eight to ten quit attempts to, okay. so that means 10% of any given smoking cessation effort will lead to smoking cessation. Uh, that is the messy world of behavior change. Uh, obesity would be pretty similar. So if you look at you know either medicine-based, otherwise clinically delivered programs, actually there's a big study that just came out today uh, not funded by Weight Watchers, funded by NIH in the Journal of Obesity that uh, basically showed that Weight Watchers actually deliver better outcomes in clinically delivered uh, group support programs. But even is when we're at our best, uh, if we can get to, say, 12 to 15 percent of a given attempt getting to 10 percent weight loss, here's the other point, who's goal weight? This is a big deal. Goal weight is not looking like a swimsuit model in People magazine. That's not goal weight. Goal weight is medically significant weight loss. Here's the good news about all this. Uh, for someone who is obese, reducing your weight by 10% reduces your risk of becoming diabetic by 60%. So that is what is called medically significant weight loss is 10%. So the average person coming into Weight Watchers, uh, to a Weight Watchers meeting, she's about five foot four, uh, and she weighs about 199 pounds. Uh, that puts her in the middle of the overweight population. I, I didn't even get into it. I have a whole part of the book where I make fun of Darian, but I don't actually cite the name of the town. <laughs> um, I might have thrown the word Stepford around a couple times, but it's sort of like, there is this interesting thing about obesity being contagious uh, and the opposite being true, and I use Darian to prove that the opposite is, off, is, is often true, where sort of peer pressure kind of works the other way as well. But what I would say is that our goal for the average person who comes to us is it would be better if she frankly went from 200 pounds to 180 pounds and stayed there. That would be great. Of course, people want to go further than that. Uh, and they, of course, the, she wants to go from 200 pounds to 135 pounds. What I would tell you is that that can happen. It's probably not a realistic goal. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time in our literature focusing people much more on getting to that first 5 to 10 percent, and then figuring out where you're going to go from there. But it's not like you start and there's this sort of magical static goal weight number that then we measure everything from. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening to this Darianne Library Podcast.